Well, good morning. Good to see you as we have just come through another week, a week that's been rather full, right? We've had good reports from the team that went to Kentucky to work on the uh, houses down there. A couple of them are back. The Hannah Waltz are here. And uh, we'll be hearing a more complete report next week during the service. So thanks for your prayers for this group. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing more of what happened down there. But as we think about weeks closer to home, those of us who were not traveling, this has been uh, some days when we've heard about different ones who have been sick or hurt. Uh, others who, for whom things are just clipping along merrily, which is great. Whatever we've been going through, wherever we find ourselves, God meets us. God is with us, and God loves us, and God continues extending grace to us and through us as we are in these various situations. The Lord wants to encourage us in a life of meaning and purpose, and part of that is worship, gathering together in, uh, in recognition of God's goodness and love, to remember the Lord, and we'll do that today as we uh, eat and drink together, and if you're joining online, you might want to find some bread and juice so you can participate a little bit later in the service. We ask the Lord for things, we thank the Lord for things, we praise the Lord, we listen to the Lord. All of that is wrapped up in worship. So as we gather for that today, let's take a breath, let's be here, and let's worship the Lord. Loving and gracious God, thank you for your goodness and for your grace. Thank you for the way that you continue to be at work around us, in us, and through us. Thank you for bringing us to this place, to this time, and as we worship together, Lord, open our eyes that we might see you, that we might sense you. We join together with sisters and brothers around the world who are worshiping you today. We're so glad to be part of a larger family like that. And Lord, as we worship, would you help us in that? Would you bless this time of gathering? We'll commit it to you now through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as we prepare together to say what believers in Christ have said for centuries through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together.
And before you sit, would you find someone nearby and say hello? Well, good morning. good morning. I love your shoes. Thank you. Those are really great. Okay. So I have a school question for you because I know how much you like school. Okay, good. Um, do you study any history in school? Do you talk about famous people? Um, well, we haven't been doing that right now because like, we've been like working on like how Europe like was trying to trade and like wow. So you're talking about global economics. Okay. That's great. That's uh, okay. So I've got a different sort of a question. <laughs> if I mention somebody like Abraham Lincoln, is that a name you know? Uh, how about Martin Luther King? All right. What do you know? Do you know anything about these people? Um, I know that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Yeah. So he's someone who's famous in our country, right? And um, so was Martin Luther King, someone who did some, a lot of good things for people, all right? Um, a different kind of a situation, but still a famous person, especially around this area, is a guy named Roberto Clemente. You know this name? All right. You have been well-educated. <laughs> okay. So, from my dad. Oh, from your dad. He likes the pirates. He likes the pirates. Well, he has good taste, <laughs> especially in the classic pirates. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> So we have these people that we know who are people from history. Roberto Clemente, Clemente is a little more recent, just like Martin Luther King. But some of these people are, are well-known in history for who they are and for what they've done. We can go even further back. There's a couple of people that I think of. Um, there's a lady named Florence Nightingale who grew up and f saw sick people around her and wanted to take care of them and um, just spent her whole life learning how to do that, she became one of the first nurses. If you know nurses today, a lot of them go back. They can trace, trace back to Florence Nightingale. And then there's another lady called Macrina. I don't know if you've heard that name before. No, not, not enough people know about Macrina. She was the older sister of um, several brothers. And a couple of those brothers went on to become famous theologians in the church, people who wrote about God and about the Bible. And um, they're, they're fairly well known if you're in the right, depending on the circles you're in. But what is less known, regrettably, is that their sister was the one who encouraged them and who kind of got, got them started on things. So we have Macrina to, think for, to thank for, for that. So I was thinking about these people who are, who are famous for things they've done, but also how they've lived. And that's true of the guy we're going to talk about today, whose name is Abraham. Is that a name you know from the Bible? Okay. So Abraham is one of the, he's really old. He's lived like 4,000 years ago, which is really hard to figure out, right? But anyway, he did some things for which he's well known. And, um, and also he lived in a way that was pretty impressive. So we're going to talk about that today too. All right, so that's history, but if you're into economics, I, I get it, and um, they're kind of different fields, but they kind of fit together in some ways, because knowing how Europeans trade with Asians, that's based in some history, too. I'm, I'm kind of fumbling around to try to make connections here, but okay. Well, so we'll talk about Abraham today, one of these famous people, um, for not only what he did, but also the way he lived, and he's a person like like Abraham Lincoln, like Martin Luther King, like Roberto Clemente, like Florence Nightingale, like Macrina, who, um, who sets a good example for us, even today, even though they're from history. Okay, all right. So how about if we pray, and then we'll keep going. Thanks, God, that you give us these people to, um, to look at and learn from. Thanks for the example they set, and uh, pray that we be encouraged by that example to um, carry ourselves in ways that are 
good and kind and helpful to others. Amen. All right. See you later. Okay. As we prepare our offerings, we remember again God's, in the words of the, uh, the song that Betsy will play, God's bounteous grace, where God just keeps giving from a generous hand. And so our offerings are a reflection of God's goodness and also of our continued faith, believing that God will carry, uh, will continue in the provision that so far has been the case. Let's give thanks now and uh, let's pray a blessing on the offerings that are given. Because God, we know that these resources come from you. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And we're grateful for the opportunity to be stewards of them and pray that we might use these funds well. In the offerings that we give now, God, we ask that they might be employed in ways that bless many and bring honor to your name. And we'll return our thanks through Christ. Amen. And as we sing that song and remember all that God has done for us and those around us, we can pause for a moment and just reflect on that and do a quick itemization of things for which we are thankful. We can bring those to the Lord in prayer. And as we pray now, let's uh, remember that as we're asking 
on behalf of different ones, as we well should. Prayer is also an occasion for us to give thanks to the Lord. So let's pray. We are grateful, God, for the privilege that is ours to come before you and lift matters that are on our hearts into your good care. And so we pray on behalf of government leaders. We pray wisdom. We pray for a desire to pursue what leads to justice and peace. We pray, Lord, for your church. And we know how difficult it can be to live in ways that honor you in various kinds of cultural conditions. And so we pray again that your people would live with clarity and courage and conviction in ways that bear witness to your goodness. We pray for this church. Lord, as we continue to serve one another and those in our community, help us to be faithful in that. Help us to be mindful of your direction. And Lord, we pray for these people who are uh, important to us for different kinds of reasons. People where we work, people in our neighborhoods, people we're related to, people we're friends with. Lord, so many different kinds of needs and situations. And we lift these before you now, especially these ones that you have laid on our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for answers to prayer. We look around this room and we see evidence of that. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to be at work in ongoing situations. And we look around this room and think of others that are connected with this church and think of that as well. Lord, help us to keep trusting you to bring the healing and the wisdom and the clarity and the patience and the strength that is needed. We pray also for ourselves that we would be open and attentive to you, that we would walk in ways that please you. And we bring all these prayers, God, trusting you for each one as we come in the name of Jesus through whom we pray now. Amen. First reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, and can be found on page 15 in the Pew Bible. The Call of Abram. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old, and he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Cana and arrived there. <clears throat> the second reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, 
as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. The word of God, the word of the Lord for our good. Thanks be to God. It's a lot of pages between Genesis and Hebrews. And Lord, we're thankful for each one of them and for what they have to say to us about you and about your way through this world. So would you help us now by your spirit to understand what's going on here and to bring it into our lives for your glory. Amen. So we meet Abraham here in Abram is his name when he's first found and then later God changes his name, adds a couple of letters. It's actually one form of the name of God put into his name. Uh, so I will be going back and forth between Abram and Abraham. It's the same guy. Well, we meet him in chapter 12 of Genesis, and his story will occupy the next number of chapters. More than a quarter of Genesis is given over to the story of Abraham. And even after that, he casts a long shadow. He's found in the Pentateuch, throughout the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He shows up in the Psalms, in the Prophets, and then uh, when we get to the New Testament, Abraham is part of the genealogy of Jesus. He also is featured in the teaching of Jesus. And then the apostles who follow Jesus pick up on Abraham as well. He's known for a handful of things. Uh, first of all, for the covenant that God makes with him. This covenant is a promise that God delivers, that God makes with him. God will make a number of covenants, but the one with Abraham uh, really is among those that stand out in Scripture. There are promises, as with every covenant. There are blessings, and there are expectations. And uh, God will speak with Abraham about this. We'll hear about uh, the promise in chapter 12. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and so on. So Abraham's known for the covenant that God makes with him. Abraham, secondly, is known for his faith. And that seems to be the point that the New Testament's especially interested in, that they pick up on this. There's a phrase in chapter 15 of Genesis where it says, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And a couple of our New Testament writers, Paul among them, will pick up on that phrase and remember Abraham as an example of someone who believed, an example that we want to follow. And then the third thing Abraham is known for is that together with his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, the three of them uh, create what we call the patriarchs of Israel. They are uh, the fathers of the Jewish nation, if you will, and they are described numerous times in those terms. We also hear about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's repeated through several places in scripture, even Jesus will pick up on that idea, remembering the God of these three men. Uh, Jesus will use that to say he is the God of the living, which is interesting given that Jesus lived 2,000 years after Abraham. And to talk about the God of Abraham as the God of the living, Jesus is trying to get an idea across there. So Abraham sets a tone along with his uh, immediate family. It sets a tone of an inclination not towards evil, but an inclination towards God. 
God whom Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob trusted, God with whom they enjoyed a satisfying relationship, the God they followed, the God they obeyed. When we meet Abraham here in chapter 12, the story is already underway. We don't hear anything about Abraham's early life other than his birth, and uh, we meet him. He's 75 years old. He will die at age 175, so if you do the math, I'm not even sure what that makes him in sort of our, in our years, right? It, we meet him at 75, that's about three-sevenths of his life. So that's what, mid-40s? You know, life expectancy of 80, 90, somewhere in there? Okay, so he's, he's well along, he's established. He's uh, married, he lives with his extended family in Ur, U-R, that's the name of the city, easy to remember, uh, is, which is just down the road from Babylon, or as it's called in Genesis chapter 10, Babel, where they had been building a tower some years before. And the Lord has spoken to Abraham, asking Abraham to go to Canaan, which we call today Israel or Palestine, uh, depending on what, what time zone we're in. Uh, it's a place that is hundreds of miles away from Ur, and it's not an easy trip. The call to go from Ur to Canaan by God to Abraham involves leaving what is familiar, leaving one's family or the extended family. And it just wasn't like today where you can go to a far place and it's easy to get there. And if you want to come back, you can. You can hop on a jet or you can use the electronics. You can connect via Zoom. Uh, when Abraham went, he went. He was gone. That was it. It was over for Ur. He wasn't coming back. And they probably weren't coming to visit on holidays. So this was the end of a significant set of relationships for Abraham. That's part of what was involved in responding to God's call. It's part of what Abraham had to process and figure out. Because to go means to leave, means you're gone. Abraham says yes, he goes. That's chapter 12 and verse four of Genesis. So Abram went. It's a yes that stands in sharp contrast to the many no's that we have seen in these early chapters of Genesis, starting at chapter one with Adam and Eve and moving our way through to hear about Cain and the people in Noah's day and even those who were building a tower at Babel. For them, God's voice was one of several and it could be ignored, often was. As we read last time in chapter 10, these people in Babel, they were adapting, adopting their own program for moving through life. They were wanting to make a name for themselves. They really didn't have much time or space for God. But Abraham is different. God speaks, Abraham listens, he agrees, and he goes. Now, it's worth noting that not only did God say, I want you to leave where you are and go to this other place, along the way, God was also promising some pretty significant blessings to Abram. You know, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. That's another nice contrast with the folks in Babel. They wanted to make their own name great. God says, I'll do that for you, Abram. It was a lot to take in, all that God was promising of Abram. Interesting to note that none of it, none of these promises are fulfilled in his lifetime. He goes on the strength that what God has said will be true. I will make you a great nation. I will give you many descendants. Abram sees a son born, a couple of kids, that's it. He gets a little bit of territory, that's it. These promises are not fulfilled. So it isn't like he's motivated by those as much as he is trusting that the God who has said these things, who has promised these things, the God, that God will bring them to pass when God pleases. 
And all this suggests then that Abram is remembered, even revered, not for his great wealth or his prestige, which he starts to acquire some, to some degree, but rather Abram is remembered for what he did and how he did it. Abraham believed. He did what God asked. He said yes. A little bit later on in chapter 26 of Genesis, we hear the Lord speaking and he is, um, he is talking to Isaac, Abram's son. And he says to Isaac, I will make your descendants as numerous as, uh, as the stars in the sky. Give them all these lands through your offspring. All nations will be blessed because Abram believed me. This is God speaking. Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and instructions. So God looks at Abram after the fact and says, this guy, when I asked him to do something, he said yes, he believed me. He, he stayed believing. He kept believing. There is that first yes to God. And we see that in Genesis 12 and verse 4, that line, Abram went. That implies that first yes. God says go and Abraham goes. There is that first yes. And then there will be from that point many occasions when one needs to decide, will I say yes here? Will I say yes to this? Will I say yes now? We know what this is like. We say yes to following God, and then situations about which God has spoken arise. Will I tell the truth here? Will I be kind here? Will I forgive here? Will I give here? Will I say yes to these? The first yes sets the stage for Abraham, for us. It serves as a touch point for all that follows. Now, it's true we slip. That happens. We can act like we haven't heard God. But then there comes this moment of conviction. And we listen to that. We turn back. We return to that yes. There are a couple of places in Genesis where Abraham slips. And that is recorded um, carefully and with perhaps a little more detail than we might be comfortable with. So it's not like Abraham does everything without any trouble. Scriptures don't gloss over that, but this isn't where Abram stays. He returns to the yes. He keeps following God, which is why he's remembered and esteemed in Jewish tradition. But when we come to the New Testament, we discover that it's not just in the Jewish tradition. Paul wants to say that Abraham is more than a local hero in Romans chapter 4, Paul will say that Abraham is the father of all who believe. And for Paul, this means Jew and Gentile. For everyone who believes, Abraham is their father. They can look to Abraham as an example, one who shows what is possible. God says, go. And Abraham says, okay, even though he didn't know where he was going. God hadn't given him a map or a phone with a GPS and the route already plugged in. God just said, go. And Abram leaves. He leaves his family. He leaves what's familiar. And this leaving, this obedience, this yes, is not just a once and done. God continues to speak, to direct, to ask. And Abram, like so many after him, keep saying yes, which is remarkable. Because so often, the decision to follow God is fraught with challenge. We think of the apostles again. We think of Paul. We think of so many since then who say yes to God only to find that life is then quite different from what is common, what is popular. How often a life with God involves delayed gratification. 
how often it challenges the natural inclination, the conventional wisdom, how often it asks for a letting go. And yet, and yet, so many do this. So many do this. They follow in Abram's footsteps when God says, will you? And the response is, yes, I will. Abraham is recalled often in Scripture as one who has done this. And as such, he offers us encouragement as well. That a life with God, a life of saying yes to God, initially and then repeatedly, this is a life worth living. Because the one who asks, the one who speaks, the one who directs, the one who calls, is good, is worthy of our trust, is for us and for this world. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for these stories, even these stories that tell us about people who are so old and so far back in history. And as we explore these stories, we discover just how contemporary they are and how much they have yet to say to us. Lord, thanks for Abram's example. Thanks for the faithfulness of this one who trusted you, who believed you, and who lived out of that faith and trust. And may this be an encouragement to us as we seek to keep saying yes to you. As we have opportunity to encourage that of others. So God makes a, a covenant with Abram, promises, blessings, expectations. There will be a number of other covenants that are highlighted in Scripture. These ways that God steps in and offers something of benefit to people and asks them to, then to respond with a life of faith and trust. When Jesus comes and begins his teaching, he will pick up on these kinds of themes, and then when he is ready to conclude his time on earth, he'll gather his disciples together for a final celebration, a meal that is meant to commemorate uh, a delivery, a rescue, and a repositioning of God's people. And the way that Jesus will talk about that is to use some language that is unexpected. As the disciples gather for a Passover meal, they expect one thing. They expect a rehearsal of history. And what Jesus does instead is to slip them into the future, actually a couple of days ahead, and then life as it stretches out from that point forward. And he will do this by using the food that's on the table, the bread and the wine, he will take the bread and give thanks and break it, and he will speak about that as his body that's given. And then he will take the cup and he will say that the cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. 
this covenant that Jesus is talking about is like other covenants in Scripture in that it's given by God to those whom God is wanting to draw into a relationship. It's got promises associated with it. With this new covenant, Jesus is talking about connection with a new family, a new community. He is referencing a new place to settle. He is anticipating ways that they will, because of this relationship, be a blessing to many. And he is reminding them that this covenant, these promises are grounded in God's faithfulness. And because of that, there's an implicit call to those offered the covenant that they might themselves live faithfully, that they would live in faith, trusting this God who has spoken. That this would be more than something of the head or even of the heart, but it would also translate into their actions, to their attitudes, to their conversations, that all of that might be shaped and formed by this one who has demonstrated faithfulness, this one who continues to call people into a relationship with himself. So as we come to the Lord's table and remember what the Lord has done, we remember what the Lord has said as well about this new covenant, about this desire that God has to be connected with people and the expectation that God has that people will follow through and live with God and towards God, inclined to the way of God. Our time at this table is meant to remind us of those truths, to give us an opportunity to reaffirm our connection, to say once again, yes. And so as we prepare to eat and drink in a few moments, let's pause before the Lord. As we reflect on wanting to say yes, let's remember that there have been times when we have said no or said nothing at all, and we have just treated God as though it's another sound among many in our lives. Let's open our hearts in confession and the prayer that we say that the Lord taught his disciples offers an encouragement to that end. And following our prayer, the choir will sing and we can use this time to meditate and reflect as well. And then we will eat and drink together. So for now, let us pause and let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh.
We'll be passing the bread through the pews, and if you're participating today, please take a piece and hold it. We'll eat together. We'll do the same with the cup as we take and hold and then drink together. When Jesus came to that time in the supper, he took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks. Knowing, God, that you were with him and that you had asked him to go through with what he was about to do. And as we reflect on that night, the night he was betrayed, we remember again his faithfulness in going through with it. And so we thank you for this opportunity to remember our Lord. We thank you for his faithfulness and for what that accomplished, what that means for us. And we bring our thanks now in his name. Amen. This is my body, he said, given for you. As you eat it, remember me.
in this cup, see the new covenant in my blood. The promises God's making. The faithfulness God's demonstrated. The blessing that accrues to you as you say yes to God. As you drink it, remember me, says our Lord. Please stand as we sing the doxology. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we are doing the church life segment right now, and there's about a couple months ago I was getting ready to, I think, sing a solo, and Betsy and I were having a conversation that, you know, this September coming up, she was going to be here for 25 years, so none of us, you know, in the, in the church, yay! <laughs> We didn't want to forget that. Um, so today we have flowers for her and or, or for her and um, for sharing all of her spiritual gifts, her talents, everything that um, I wish I could remember all the things. I am going to have her talk a little bit if she will, but um, you know she does so many things for all of us. The choir, um, I know, you know, we have the children's choir, the bells. She is a very, very big part of the Advent Festival as well. Um, so we just um, wanted to thank um, her for this, and we are going to have some snacks down there for her as well. So, um, but you know, we at St. Thomas, we just very much appreciate everything you've done over all the years that you've been here, and we just wanted to celebrate you today. Thank you. So, do you want to say a few words, anything about? Well, the only. Your time? The only thing I'd like to say is that you always read and hear about people really not liking their job and wishing they were doing something else. To me, this is the most perfect job I could have. I don't treat this as a job. This is just fun. I love doing it. I will, my mother was the organist at the church for about 40 years, and her aunt was organist for about 25 before that. So. My goal is to do that, do this longer than they did. So, but thank you very much. This is a total surprise. Thank you, Betsy. We love you. Um, I am an elder here at St. Thomas, and here's some notes about upcoming services and activities that we have this week. Um, enjoy some coffee and snacks down at the Friendship Cafe and Fellowship Hall after the service, and please come and talk with Betsy and um, have some snacks with her. 
Um, at 10.30 today, also in Fellowship Hall, we'll have the Adult Forum. We'll be starting a new study into the Gospel of Luke. The mid midweek online Bible study is looking into James on Wednesdays, um, and that takes place via Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. All are welcome to drop in once or often, as many you know, times as you would like. Um, there's more in the bulletin, so please take a copy of that with you today. And have a great week, everyone. Please stand for our closing hymn. When Lori read the scripture for us this morning, she uh, went to a passage in Hebrews, which talks about Abram, Abraham and a number of other people whose lives of faith were recognized, remembered, and commended. And our benediction comes from the end of that long passage, that list of names and activities that demonstrated their faithfulness, where the writer wants to encourage us and says this, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Abraham and the lot of them, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And so as we go from this place into whatever's next, May it be with our eyes on Jesus. May it be with a yes in our hearts and a faith that God will continue to do good 
in us, around us, and through us. Amen? Amen. Amen.